Welcome to the Hometown Hollywood Podcast, where you can find advice, inspiration, and strategies for success from talented people that are making a name for themselves inside the film industry, but outside of major film cities. Here's your host, Travis Myers. Boom. Oh, no, I love it. it. <laughs> I, I heard Wilson try to do his like radio voice. Homeboy oh, um, thinks he can do his radio <laughs> voice. <laughs> I was not prepared uh, for that at all. <laughs> oh, <man>. Travis! <laughs> yeah, I was like, all right. There it is. But uh, I've never been so hyped man. before. Even when I played basketball. Um, <laughs> I wish he had been there. We may have won a few games. Hey, my name is Travis Myers, and this is the Hometown Hollywood Podcast. Today's guest is Matthew Rojas, a director based out of Dallas, Texas. I think that Matthew comes at filmmaking with such an interesting, athletic, and also religious perspective, and you can tell that the hard work and dedication he's put into his craft has really paid off. You can really see that once Matthew sets his mind up that he's going to achieve something, you can already consider it done because he's going to do whatever it takes to accomplish it. If you need some motivation and advice on how to achieve your filmmaking goals, it doesn't get much better than this interview. In this interview, you'll learn about Matthew's transition from football to filmmaking in faith, fighting to get into film school, P5 faux fum, I'm using a lot of Fs right now, how Eraserhead changed his whole perspective on movies, working with producers like the one and only Wilson Lemieux. You have to go back to his podcast episode to understand how Batman and TIE Fighters inspire the greatest body shop ad you've ever seen, telling engaging stories without words, hiding psychological triggers like flashing lights in plain sight, him and his wife working together like a dadgum dream team, and a conversation he continues to have with his former self. Also, in this interview, it's pretty easy to tell that I was hecka congested. So uh, I know it probably sounds like I'm perpetually congested, but this just takes it to a whole new level. And that's what Matthew does with his art. And that was one of the worst jokes I've made in a while. It was a pleasure to get to talk with Matthew about his journey in the film industry, and I'm confident you'll enjoy what he has to say. So, let's jump right into the show. So, I have, uh, ever since we had the podcast with Wilson, and he let me know of y'all's producer-director relationship, I've looked at your stuff and just been floored by it. I think you're incredible director you have an amazing vision for the projects you do but let's go back to the beginning tell us who is matthew rojas and where did you get started yeah it's always that right it's like we're like <laughs> what happened it's funny because like we're talking about <laughs> we're talking about sports earlier and you know i'm i'm a very short person but i grew up just playing football and actually uh doing boxing and hmm. and so like my world as a kid was always like playing sports and you know the older I got everybody started growing and set for me and um it was one of those things I was playing football all the way up until my junior year or sophomore year of high school and um what kept me on the high school football team was I was really good at memorization as far as like the playbooks and stuff and so basically we were having a scrimmage broke my nose and I remember coming home my mom was like that's pretty much it like you're done. And, you know, it kind of was like one of those things, like it was like the writing was definitely on that wall of like, Hey, you're not going to go down the tunnel, you know, at, you know, for the university, university of Texas football. Like it's just, you know, I mean, these guys I was going up against were, you know, USC like recruits or, you know, top recruits for Notre Dame. And, you know, these oh guys gosh. were like six, nine and I was blocking them. And I was actually, my, my uh, position was a center and we actually had a short quarterback so he could actually call the blitzes. <laughs> and uh, see all the see uh, like see the field a little bit more with me, but um, so growing up, sports was just all, like it was just my jam, and so my mom made me quit. I quit, and I really had no idea what I wanted to do. And I was at that time, like you know, I was a sophomore going to be a junior, and then you know, there's always that conversation. It's like, what you know, what's your future look like? What do you want to do? And I never really yeah. put a lot of thought into it, and. Um, I'm a son of a boxing trainer and, you know, I, I, I dug boxing and I was even considering like, you know, training boxers and, you know, my dad being in the business for, you know, 30 plus years, he was just like, this is, this is not for you. And like, it's and not, not in a mean way. It was just like, he, you know, he yeah. wanted me to have a little bit more aspirations than just going to a gym and 
being a trainer of sorts. Um, and so I, there was a lot of soul, you know, soul searching and got a job at Walmart and I was pushing carts and, you know, um, it was like the only job I could have. I remember my dad taking me to drive in his new truck and he's like, do you like this truck? And I was like, man, I love this truck. He's like, you want this to be yours? I was like, dude, I want it to be mine. And he like pulls up, <laughs> he pulls up at a Walmart. He's all right, get a job, you know? And, <laughs> and then again, like I said, I didn't really have, I had responsibilities during the summer, but obviously again, like, you know, it was always spring training, you know, summer training, uh, with football yes. and, you know, it was just one of those things. And so I had this job, I was going on to be a junior now. And, um, I was just kind of pushing carts and, you know, um, I come from a very spiritual background. So like, it was like a question I had for God, like, Hey, like, what do I do? Like, what did you put me here on earth to do? And, um, and I just kind of had like this, like kind of vision of just making movies and, and, you know, at that time, I, you know, I like my favorite movie at that time was, you know, Jurassic Park, you know, you know, yeah. growing up, it was just always my parents took me to every movie that came out in the movie theaters. And so there was like an appreciation of it. And it was one of those things like movies. I didn't even know you could do that, like aside from just not living in Hollywood. Um, and so I kind of, you know, told the Lord, it's like, if you kind of put this in me, like, I'm just going to have to trust you. And so, and I wasn't really necessarily a good student at, at in high school because, um, again, it was just like, I didn't really care for it. But, um, yeah. so I didn't have the grades to get into a prestigious school. Um, I did apply for USC and the NYU pro summer program and did not get accepted in those. Or actually, <laughs> I got accepted in the NYU Film Institute for a summer. But, man, the cost for that was just, like, unbelievable. And yeah, so, yeah. um you know, all these like rejections and stuff were just like, okay, what, what, what is it I need to do? Like, how do I get my feet wet here? And it's one of those things for me, like if something's like, in, like, especially with, if it's from God, like if it's implanted in me, like I'm just going to go and get it no matter what it looks like. Um, I'm kind of ignorant of the obstacles. I kind of just kind of go after it and kind of just trust him, so to speak. Yeah. And so, um, so I applied to all these colleges of being a filmmaker. I remember going home and told my dad, I'm like, Hey, I'm going to be a filmmaker, <laughs> you know? And it, to my surprise, you know, it, they were just like, cool, you know, like, all right, yeah. like, what does that look like? You know, we don't know what that looks like. Let's, so let's like kind of figure it out with you. So I applied to all these schools, getting a bunch of rejections. And, um, and then I looked into the art Institute of, of Dallas, um, their film program, a couple of buddies of mine have gone there had went there and there were some success, you know, they had a lot of success and their success rate for you graduating was, um, was pretty high as far as like you walked out with the job. And so yes. I applied and by like tooth and nail, I barely, like just got in. Like, I think I, my grades couldn't do it. And so I had to like take this like assessment test and like, I think I passed it with like a 70, like it was just, I was oh, just man. not smart at all. And so, um, so I barely got in and it's weird, man. Cause it's one of those things that's like, I was so committed to be a filmmaker at that time. I was like, you know, I can't blow this opportunity. Like I need to kind of go all in. And so, you know, during my experience at the art Institute, I was like, I did really well. I was like on the Dean's list and, um, it's, it's weird. It's interesting. Like the educational system, like it's, if you really are passionate about something or want to learn something, you know, it's, you can see like, I don't know. My, my interest in that was like not to fail, but it, it wasn't that necessarily. It was just like, I just wanted to keep learning and learning. And so, yeah. um, so I went to film school for about four years and it was awesome. Graduated. Um, there was, I think 13 of us that ended up graduating. So, um, <laughs> it, it was a major filtration from like, I think a hundred people that showed up on the first day to, oh, you know, possibly That's 13 crazy. people. So, yeah, it was, it was nuts. And it was one of those things like every week you had to kind of bust out something with cinematography or, um, or some of the film theory you learned or, you know, blocking, editing, you know, I mean, they definitely took you through the ringer, but, um, but it helped me be a better filmmaker and it made me really appreciate, you know, just all aspects of filmmaking. But the story I like to tell a lot is like, I showed up, like, it was like intro to, it was like film theory, I think, um, I don't know what the class was particularly, but, um, it was, uh, one of our professors, her name was Lisa Osmus. She shows up and, you know, we're all kind of just so green and, you know, she sees like all of us, like just are hungry. Like, you know, 
she asked that typical question, like, what do you want to be? Like, I want to be like the Michael Bay in movies or <laughs> I want to make Terminator 2. And, you know, I think that's a famous Paul Thomas Anderson conversation. And she's, you know, she's just kind of was quiet and she was like, OK, who has seen like the real films? And we're like, what? And she's like, you know, so she started like naming off names like Alejandro Jodorowsky, like David Lynch, um, yeah. she's Stanley Kubrick, you know, um, Gaspar Noel and all these like film. We're like, we don't know any of these people. <laughs> and so she had a copy of a, v- a VHS copy of uh, Eraserhead. And she says, for this class, mm-hmm. we're going to watch this film. And um, this is going to be just your assignment, just to watch it. And so we watched it. And I remember coming home so shaken of, of what I've just watched because um, wow. it was it was one of the first films I've saw that really kind of like went outside the spectrum of storytelling for me. And like where I went home and I told my parents, I was like, man, I don't know if I can do this. And they're like, what? Like, what are you talking about? I was like, no, like you can do a lot with filmmaking. Like you can like, this is cinema in some ways. And you know, that film kind of, it's a very (laughs) distorted film, but it's like dealing with certain anxieties that I kind of felt through, but he, you know, David Lynch does it in such a surreal manner and these metaphors and what you can do visually, you know, all these things were starting to connect in my head. And I remember just like a playbook and football, like, you know, there's definitely parts of the lineman where you have to, you know, go to your right to block or, you know, the guard pulls, you know, from the left for a counter. Like, it's like all these things to make a nice play. And for that film and, you know, his other films, his other works and films from Ken Russell, like, I, it was a whole new world for me. And yeah. I was like, okay, this is what I really want to do. Um, and so I think that's what kind of pushed me to be the very best filmmaker I could be. And out of that, you know, I graduated and got a job. I worked for it at a small agency right after that. And, but from that too, like I built a bunch of networking and um, still friends to the core guys that we were, that I graduated with to this day. And, you know, they're just as successful as me. So, yeah, that's amazing. I really love that story. It's like you got your answer for what you were supposed to do and you fought for it and you, you didn't quit and you made it happen. Dude, it's, it's one of those things like I hated the library in high school. I hated it so much. But I like for film school, like I couldn't get out of the library. I, like, I was like reading like all these analysis on all these films. Like I it was it was it was so weird. Like it was just like, you know, I was reading up on Tony Scott, Ridley Scott. And, you know, it was one of those things where it's just like, wow, like this is my interest. I it was it was just surreal for me because, again, like I didn't like school. I didn't like education. Yeah. But it was one of those things where it's like I wanted like to be the very best I could as far as this craft goes. For sure. So I noticed several of your projects, they may not have hardly any dialogue or very, maybe little to none. And they're really like commercials or films that you just, that speak directly to your feelings. Do you think that style comes from your experience at the Art Institute, like with the racer head? Cause I, I really love it. And I feel like when I was watching through your, your films and stuff, I was like, how do you think this way? <laughs> I guess I have a very linear way of thinking. And it's like, man, this is just so evolved from where my personal level of direction goes. And so um, where do you think that? I don't know if I'm making a whole lot of sense, but. No, uh, no, you're no, it's the, the, the million dollar question. I filmmakers ask that awesome. So like, you know, how do you find your voice or whatever? And yeah. what I did appreciate about film school, and even if you don't go to film school, my grandpa would always say, like, use what you have. And like for me it was school and I couldn't I couldn't stay home and like look up, you know, even at that time, it was 2008, like YouTube was I don't even know, it was, it was just barely becoming a thing. So like there's no DIY, like there's no like unless you went under a tutelage of somebody in the industry, which I did not know. So like for me, it was like I needed to nosedive in school. But like for somebody like that wants to be a filmmaker, like how do you find your voice? It's like, you know, learning obviously the technical aspects of it, but like, like watch what you like, you know? And I think Mm -hmm. I appreciate it about film school and I appreciate about people's early work is that they're trying to feel, they're going through like this filtration process of like, even in some ways of like, I remember I went through like a major Igmar Bergman phase and like 
just love the way he composed shots. You know, I loved his challenge on religion and, you know, Christianity. And, you know, he was asking some serious questions and I'm, you know, and if you watch some of my early work, like it, like it's very Bergman esque, but you know, yeah. as soon as you kind of look back on it, it just looks like a Bergman film and it looks like you're kind of like in some ways mimicking his style, but it's not really you. And so what I did appreciate about film school was, I had all these roots and these filmmakers that had really dug. I was more copying their style rather than implementing on what I needed to say. And I think for somebody like Lynch or Kubrick, um, the thing that attracts me is certain rules they give to themselves and just not finding the most interesting shots, but it's more or less of just a shot that can really speak words. And so I think for me, you talked about a lot of my stuff has like little to no dialogue and that, you know, that's something I want to grow out of. I want to shoot dialogue, but I think I want to kind of keep chiseling away of like, if I can like do something with little to no dialogue and kind of tell the story, like as a way I have with visuals, I want, you know, I want to work with somebody that has a way with words and kind of combining those. And so, um, I look up to a relationship, uh, the relationship with Fincher and Sorkin for the social network. Like, you know, he was a very visual, if you watch his music videos from the eighties and nineties, I mean, his visual language is just through the roof and you're like, Whoa, you know, and you know, a lot of the music is not my cup of tea, but you know, when it came to him to create seven, you know, and working with some solid screenwriters, it was already the foundation of who he was now was capitalizing on the storytelling aspects along with, you know, with the dialogue and stuff. And so, um, that's up okay. to this point, you know, I'm, I'm working with several screenwriters and, you know, I, I definitely, even after I got out of film school, I was married to the fact that I liked the, the look written and directed by Matthew Rojas. And, but over time, it's like, you know, you want to work with people that are smarter than you. Um, and you want to collab with some of the best people. And I've noticed the projects that I dig and that I like are usually I'm not the smartest person in the room. And it's just, you know, kind of bouncing off ideas and kind of go off it. But I think, the filmmakers I mentioned, like, you know, Lynch and Jodorowsky and uh, Nicholas Winnie Refn, like, those are the guys that kind of, like, there's a respect towards the visual aspect of it. And one one single image or frame from their films could just tell a story alone. And I'm, I'm definitely all about it, you know? Yeah, I really like the the style in those videos that, have, that really have the little to no dialogue. Um, it's like, I feel like if you can tell a story without saying a thing, that's pretty powerful. And uh, like in your uh, film, Indivisible, I didn't have to hear a single word, but uh, <laughs> I could experience eight different emotions just by watching yeah. it and the colors. And um, so I think that's amazing. So you mentioned a little bit you want to work with people that are smarter than you or you want to work with talented people. How do you go about finding those talented people? Do you have a method or a strategy for networking and finding talented people uh, coming out of film school. I worked at a small agency and then I worked at a, a church, um, a small church here in Dallas. And then from there, like um, I didn't know you could do videos in the church world. And so um, I would reach out to a lot of people on Vimeo and kind of connect with them and kind of like started just developing friendships. And then from there I ended up working at a mega church here in Dallas and oh. that kind of created some credibility for me um, to where it was easier to kind of reach out to people, you know, and have like a quick response, you know, on the basis of they were just kind of a fan of the work of my work and I was a fan of theirs. And so um, it was easier access for me. And then like some of the people I've met throughout my life, like it was meeting somebody here and then I got to meet somebody else through them. And it was just, you know, a matter of like, it was just like all these things kind of like aligned together to and basically I end up working with the people I work with now, but man, it really kind of just starts relationally. I think, you know, talking to like a DP or, you know, or a sound designer, like, you know, it's a matter of like, we just have kind of the same taste and, um, and also too, like there's definitely some cold calls or not cold calls, but cold emails I've kind of sent out to like DPs and other filmmakers. I was like, Hey, like, here's the short I'm writing, you know, what do you think? And usually that most often kind of catches their eye. Cause you know, a lot of them are from the commercial world. Um, yes. and I feel like every, a lot of filmmakers are just down to do a cool creative. And so they'll see it, they'll respond like, Hey, I'm down to help. And 
you know, and you'd be shocked of who shows up on set, you know, it's like, and then from, you know, treating them right, be a respecter of them, you know, having a fun experience on that set. And it kind of leads to, you know, Hey, like, you know, we're texting about movies. what do you think about this movie? Hey, I'm right. Hey, what are you coming up with writing now to, you know, it just becomes all these things to where like, you know, outside of set, you know, we're just buddies. And so yeah. those are the people like I kind of tend like, you know, kind of go with and, there for a while I was trying to reach out to like people that, you know, I did admire the work, but over time, you know, if you kind of create your own crew and create your own friendships, like those are the people you want to work with, you know, like, like I said, I mean, there's definitely commercials and there's definitely jobs I work on. They're not the most fun creative, but you know, it's what I look forward to is not only making my day, but like, you know, we get to go and have dinner and, you know, they'll come to my house or I'll go to their house and, those are the things where like I really get to like enjoy, um, so to speak. And so, but you yeah. know, as far as networking goes, like it, I ha- definitely, ha- it's been a mixture of that, but it's all relationally, but you know, there's definitely been some success where some people just reached out to me and, and I've reached out to them like, Hey, like, like your stuff, like, what do you think? And you know, all they can say is no, you know, or not respond, yeah. you know, but um, you gotta, you gotta be a familiar face and, I definitely uh, testify to like having credibility as well. I mean, you know, put out good work and, you know, just don't, don't, don't be rude. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's always good advice. Uh, yeah. Don't be a jerk. And yeah. <laughs> things will work out as long as you're putting out good work and awesome. I love, I love that. That's one of the things I really like about filmmaking personally it's like the time while i'm making the film or project or commercial i'm just getting having an excuse to work with my friends then exactly uh some of the best memories i have are just like the 48 hour film races i've been a part of and uh-huh yeah my friends can just talk about it for hours like oh i remember yeah. when this happened or when we crashed that car <laughs> into a building <laughs> dude 100 percent. it's it's one of those things it's like and then you like, yeah, years later, you're looking back on it and you're just like laughing, you know, it's like, and I think that's where it becomes like, you're no longer like, it's no longer work. Obviously for commercials, it's no longer work. It's actually fun. But when you're doing, you know, when you're doing passion projects, you're like, man, this is cinema like too, like, you know, not only what we're putting on screen, but Scorsese says, you know, what matters is off screen. I'm, I'm assuming he's talking within the story of the film, but I think off screen off, you know, on set, like that's cinema as well. Like you're just making, making cool stuff with your buddies, you know? Yeah. And and that was cool too. There was, there was an innocence before this whole Instagram thing kind of happened was I remember like, you know, me and a core buddies would just go out and just make stuff and try stuff. And, you know, we went through that phase where we were like, we're heavily involved in Radiohead and we're like, Oh, what's Tom York working on now? Like, like let's make something (laughs) like that's Tom, Tom York or Johnny Greenwood influenced. And, um, and there was a sense of beauty of like not having our phones and taking pictures or showing screen grabs. It was more of just like us trying things out and the excitement of creating it. And then we would put it on timeline. We'll watch it like a rough cut or something. And then we would just be like, man, this is cool. Like, you know, we're really doing it. We're really doing it. And there's, you know, it's one of, it's one of the things that's changed over time with social media, because I feel like now the clout is just going to create something just for you to post a screen grab or a frame and not really yeah. like, it's no longer the product anymore, you know, type of thing. And it's, or it's not even not the product, but it's like not a, the experience is kind of dwindled down to just a frame, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. so, there was, it was, I'm, I'm definitely appreciative of my time of like, kind of like, and always finding that I think when indivisible, it was very much like that. It felt very film schooly and there's an opportunity and we were just like, Hey, like, let's just try it out and like have no, you know, like kind of no, I mean, we definitely, there was definitely vision behind it, but it was very much like, let's just try some cool things out. And, you know, we posted, we said, no, don't post pictures on set, just be present type of thing. Um, And it was probably the most fun I've had in a long time. Really? That's really cool. I, I've been, uh, (laughs) I guess when I'm on social media, I get ads for like the light phone, which uh, (laughs) doesn't have any internet or any connection besides calling and texting. And I think it has GPS or something, but it's like, yeah. How interesting would that be if I didn't have to take, uh, a screenshot of every <laughs> every project or if I didn't have to 
take a picture of my food <laughs> while I'm eating it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, it's, it's like we're like programmed to like not show off, but like, you know, there is definitely a sense of we want to feel valued and I'm not opposed to Instagram. I mean, it's just, it's like, you know, listening to the filmmakers I look up to, like most of them don't have Instagrams or social medias or Twitter, like, but these guys are just putting out work and it's like, man, that's so cool. And you can feel like the freedom they have of just like, not having get me on their phone but like they're just writing their next screenplay or their next thing for you know or they're just trying new things out so it's just yeah. there's a beauty to it and i think it shows in a lot of the work yeah it's just there's a strange balance i think people up and coming in the industry it's like they have to get their name out there so the yeah. instagram kind of seems to be the way to do that but at the same time you don't want to be all on there all the time so you don't get like uh S- stuck in it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So, let's go into one of your projects. So the Loki's Body Shop. Me and Wilson, or I guess Wilson, <laughs> talked more about it. But he's like, "Oh yeah, Matthew Rojas directed it. I got uh, John Carrington and shot the heck out of it. And uh, I just set the the sandbox so they could work in, and they just did their thing. And I let my hitters hit. And that's probably yeah. the best impression I could do of him." At this point, but <laughs> it's like I imagine him talking to me. Wow! You could just just imagine a lot more excitement <laughs> in those words. Yeah. But um, so I've got we've got that part of the story of the first Loki's body shop, and then after the episode came out, y'all made another one. Uh, so what does the sandbox look like when Wilson um is passing you the idea? How much is he giving you? So you talked about like away with visuals, you know. A lot of my passion projects are like little to no dialogue. Well, trend, you know, that's cool and all like, but like you have to essentially get paid. <laughs> and so there's <laughs> definitely the, what David Lynch and all these other art artists, uh, you know, they're very gracious of like having probably Patreons or people that kind of help them at least in their startup. I think AFI helped with a lot with Eraserhead, but um, it was a lot of hands on for him. But for me, I needed to make money. And so I, the, the artsy stuff did just did not cut it. Um, and so I, you kind of learned that real quick coming out of film school of like, you know, you come out of film school, like I have final say, or I have final cut. It's, you know, don't mess with the voice. And that's, it's not how reality is. (laughs) Like you definitely have, like if you're called to do, you know, commercial work or, you know, a project for a client, like you are there to serve the client. And so, um, there was definitely a little filtration process for me of like learning demographics. And I think I really, uh, enjoyed my experiences working for the churches because, you know, your, your demographics, like the most conservative people you ever met in your life, but like yeah. communicating story, but still not compromising your vision but like finding a, a balance or a rhythm, so to speak, of what needs to be communicated to you kind of doing like adding your your flair to it and then the overall package and, you know, overall. And and it, things change. I mean, obviously from your like, you know, when there's money involved, that's not your money. Like there's definitely other voices um, that have a say and, you know, you got to be willing to in some aspects play ball. And I've noticed the people that play ball and have good relationships with their clients or the ones that are consistent. And so um, I ended up uh, started doing commercials. Uh, for, I went from, I segued from the church to doing commercials and secular commercials, which is a whole new experience for me because I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a strong believer in Christ. And, you know, I was kind of like, is this is the right move for me. And it very much was because it was more or less now, like I can sell to conservatives now, like, you know, that start actually like implementing like smoothies or then let's implement a shoe or a, you know, a body shop. And so definitely things that I'm, that interest me, but also too, is like, okay, it's one of those things. It, I do feel like it's a challenge for me. And like my whole aspect and a thing I learned from Paul Thomas Anderson in one of his interviews is that he don't lose the integrity of whatever it is you're making. So if you're making something on oil, oil, or the oil industry, like have integrity, do your research, you know, what does this look like, you know, you know, from point A to point B, how, what did it look like, you know, in, you know, the early 1920s or, you know, the early 1800 or the late 1800s. Um, and yeah. so I take that into my work, you know, even for Loki's Body Shop, like, you know, I, it's a matter of just like meeting with them and looking at, you know, what they do and 
um, you know, and, but there's also beauty too of like seeing things, you know, I see things different, you know, they probably seen, it's probably become so mundane for them to like, but for a car, but for me and for like the crew, it's like, <laughs> whoa, you know, that's cool. You know, like <laughs> it's one of those things. And like, and so I did appreciate I, what I appreciate about commercials is you, you become a good, you learn to become a good steward with the budgets, but also too, it's no longer your, uh, pro, you know, it's, it, it is your voice and it's your direction, but it's like, like you're meeting at a point where both parties feel happy with it. And, you know, yeah. I mentioned David Fincher on his work with music videos, but also his commercial work and a lot of Jonathan Glazer and uh, a lot of a lot of uh, Ridley Scott. And what I liked about those guys was, yes, they were doing things for Nike. They were doing things for um, car commercials, sun lotion, whatever. But it still had like their flair and their touch to it. And it made you inspire, inspired you so much more of like, man, I want to go out and make a, a shoe commercial because yeah. it was just their influence. And so taking that into these low key body shop ads um, was very much that. I, I know the first one we wanted to make more of a brand film and talk about legacy. And so it was a little bit more, you know, I kind of added of like, you know, how about a kid like passing through the city of Amarillo, you know, like, you know, the passing of one new generation, but what's been already established by the old. Um, and so when these projects or kind of come to me, there's definitely, it can go one of two ways. There's either one already a brief or some boards ready to go and you kind of go and just execute it. Or another one, which gets me excited is the, they have the brief, but they tell you, Hey, make a treatment for this. How do you kind of see this playing out and basically uh-huh. showcasing all your cards on the front end and pe- basically like pitching to win the job. Um, and so that gets me excited where I kind of dive in for about, probably about three or four days, depending what the deadline is for the, the, the pitches or the treatments are, but I'll, you know, I do believe writing's not just, you know, typing things on text edit or, you know, or on Celtics, it's very much just researching and watching movies or watching, watching things or looking at art books and, you know, looking at photographs. So with low key, yeah. the, they were a such, they were a cool client. They were like, man, we don't know this. We just know that we want to like, put our name out there. And so, um, and not being from Amarillo, um, I remember I went up there, we kind of scouted the place and Amarillo has definitely a, a unique feel to it. Um, and kind of like understanding like the past and, you know, and the future, like, you know, like what has happened there and then like what entails, like what, you know, it's just continually growing. And so, but these guys, you meet, you know, you go and meet low key and, you know, you know, their shop is, you know, just definitely very blue collar and you know these guys are working tooth and nail of just making sure that all these vehicles are put out safe and you know and there's definitely harsher conditions out there and so i wanted to kind of communicate that with the first brand film of like what it means to be a legacy especially since Loki's passed on his body shop to his kids and now they're having kids and now it's like you know this family institute which is so cool um so that was essentially those were the kind of things that me and wilson or even like me and an executive producer, not, you know, for other commercials, like we kind of talk about and kind of pull, like, I think this is what they're trying to communicate. You know, I put that down and then that's when I start getting ready for that pitch. And so on that one, it was very much these conversations I had with Wilson and with the client. And then um, it went on from there. And that first one was such a success for them. I think their uh, business, I might be wrong. I want to say like they're in business improved by about 200% just from that Holy commercial chaos. you know just they were just overwhelmed and happy and and it's too it's one of those things it's like whether big brands or small brands like it's like you got to still put your 100 percent into it and you know hearing that it's a, as a success story is just like man this is awesome to coming this year they were like hey you know what we just trust you guys <laughs> whatever you guys want to do just go for it and um <laughs> i re- i remember i got the call to do this year's low key body shop and uh i joe schumacher just had just died and so i was like watching batman forever and batman and robin <laughs> <laughs> and i was i was noticing a lot of these textures that schumacher would like to do and like you know with the fans and like just it was the way he places the camera and i was really admiring his work and then i watched um another bad terrible film alien 3 and <laughs> I, I was kind of like in this headspace of visual, like visually speaking. And I was like, and Wilson called me and said, Hey, let's make a look like we're going to make another one. 
And I definitely, and, you know, and going off like of just some of the directors I named in the 80s and 90s, um, some of their ads and their ads were just, you know, in some ways like sexy. There was just, there was just something sexy about them. There was, you yeah. know, it was, it was hot fire. Like it was moving. Is there a narrative? Cool. If not cool. Like it was more yeah. of just like showcasing the product in such a unique way. Like, Hey, here it is. Take it or leave it. And I, my approach was so much different as far as the first brand film with this one. And, yeah. you know, even hiring John Carrington, like it was like, Hey, like let's make every shot has to be meaningful. Every shot has to be the most beautiful thing we've ever done. Like, let's just own it. And so it was awesome. And, but because of their trust from us from last year, I got to be more, a little bit more playful, but obviously still that communication was there with them of, you know, their approval. We wanted to make sure that we weren't showcasing them in a wrong way. Um, but it was one of those things like what's the success and with the track record already with them, it was more or less of like, Hey, just run, run with it. We trust you. Let's you know go for it. And so I think our initial, our, our, our goal for this, this past years was just, let's just make an ad as far as instead of a brand film. Huh. That's awesome. So the Batmobile may have inspired yeah. some of the shots. No, it did. It very much did. It's <laughs> like, especially with the tools. I mean, if you go back and look at it, the tools, especially is the beginning of Batman forever when he's getting his, all his utilities ready for his belt or his utility oh, belt. Uh, it's so it's almost like I wanted to transcend like a mechanic, like, you know, as soon as like he's even like lifting up the car up, you know, it's the Batmobile kind of coming up, getting ready for prep, you know, as Batman's about to get into it, <laughs> this mechanic's about to start his job, you know, and so even how he's kind of putting on his, yeah, so <laughs> there's a lot yeah. of Batman elements to it. That is so, awesome. I'm, yeah. I'm going to go watch that again after this interview, and I'm going to appreciate it a thousand times more. <laughs> If you're going to fit in like a latex butt or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> that would have made it. <laughs> yeah. and, a, and a lot of the car shots, too. I had done a car spot locally here, and I worked with an awesome team. They're called Speed Patrol, Max and Cagle. Um, and uh, kind of doing two car spots back to back was a challenge because the whole thing for me and the whole thing I take to, to heart is don't repeat yourself. Um, in some aspects yeah. and if you do expound on it um, so for me a lot, I remember the the first car the running the car spot we did I was watching car I probably watched probably watched over 200 car spots in two days of just oh nailing gosh. down moves for car spots and so I think in the final car spot it was like maybe like there's only like seven shots but I knew I wanted to make sure I didn't sound like a fool you know working with like a motor crane and stuff like that. But for this one, I didn't want to do that anymore. And because I felt like I've kind of, this is just this kind of, this kind of piece didn't call for it. So a lot of the shots for the, the new low keys was very much influenced by star Wars. And so I watched a lot of the tie uh -huh. fighters and a lot of those sequences kind of like how Ryan Johnson shot it, Abrams shot it, you know, even Lucas of how they kind of shot those and kind of edited accordingly so you can still use your influences you know it's just one of those things so i really think loki's body shot for giving me the opportunity to play batman and star wars at the same time because that was like <laughs> my ultimate goal and so it was a lot of yeah, fun. that is the dream yeah oh yeah that's I, awesome well i love that you had said that you may have not been the best student or like in high school or something, but once you found your, I guess, your passion in directing, it became easy for you. And it seems like that's something I sometimes takes for granted is how much research there is. And so you're like doing a research project and learning so much with every commercial or film. I think that's really awesome that like you're willing to do the, the homework of watching 200 car ads in a day or I don't know. I think that's a cool aspect. But once you find something that you can really latch on to, the, the homework isn't as difficult. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like and it's like you want to do it, too. It's not like I think when it's like if I'm writing a short or a commercial, um, I did a shave spot, too. It was, you know, that was definitely calling for they wanted to be different, but they wanted to have they want to have some familiarity with it. And I noticed some of the successful directors, storytellers. Um, there's definitely a mixture of like vision and art artistry, but it's also to familiarity. So for instance, like 
like for I keep going back to this film, like for Eraserhead, yeah, that's such a surrealist film. But at the end of the day, Henry, uh, you know, he's just so anxious to be a father, you know, so there's some familiarity to it. And a lot of it, I think when you have some of that, um, it can make a cohesive piece rather than a piece that's going to be at the MoMA, you know, so to speak. <laughs> so I think there's has to be a balance of it. And I think with uh, the shape piece that I did, it was like a, a lot of familiarity with like some of these moves that have been done with Gillette and with other products, um, but also still like adding like, oh, like, you know, let's do it in black and white, you know, like something like it's classy, you know. So there's yeah. like certain elements that's like I'm noticing him growing as a filmmaker, like keep adding familiarity, don't be totally off the cuff and if you do have uh let it have meaning you know um a good example is uh, there's this italian film and there's like these rolling blackouts or like there's like these strobe effects that are happening i forgot the film it's in it's in italian i can't say it but um at the beginning of that film it says hey this building's having rolling back blackouts kind of just be prepared for it but when it gets into like the action and the horror it it like intensifies because you have these strobes of light but as an audience you're like oh that's because it's the rolling blackouts but it kind of enhances your experience of like and then you kind of become vulnerable to like these artistic decisions that the director made it's just phenomenal but that's very hard to do and so that's where it's like i'm trying to find the balance even within my writing and you know a lot of my passion projects and even commercials the, what you just described kind of reminds me of uh, your film, The Altar. Yeah. Um, where the lights were flashing and um, only because I was, I like to pay attention to the light. I was like, why is that happening? But at the same time, <laughs> I was also thinking, this makes it awesome. Like, <laughs> this makes it so intense. I got so nervous during that, that while watching <laughs> that film. I was like, dang, this, no. this is working. It's like a... I don't know, psychologically affecting me. For that one, it was like, you know, for the main character, you're just in the mind of the main character. And each time he felt like he got it wrong, it, we started to become in his subconscious of, you know, how angry he was getting to, you know, when he does his final act at the end, you kind of come back to reality. There's almost like those anger moments. I feel like when you're angry, you're like, oh, you know, like. Yeah. You know, you do something, whether you punch the wall or something and you like, it's like that Bruce Banner moment. You come out of the Hulk. You're like, whoa, where am I? You're like, you know, there's actually yeah. like, why did I act <laughs> this way? And so, you know, talking with my DP on that one, Brandon Sabell is like, he kept implementing like, what if we like, you know, we did get into his psyche as far as like doing some DMX operating. And we worked with one of the best DMX operators. Yeah, I mean, in Texas, his name's Titus Fox, and he kind of set it up to where we set up each move, and each time he got more angrier. And we actually did shoot that one in chronological order, but each time he got angrier, we kept changing the systems to it. But um, uh. but yeah, but it's it's cool because it it was one of those experiences. People would watch the film, and then they didn't see it on the front end. It was so hidden, but it was in plain sight, I guess. And so yeah. I, I I definitely felt there was some success. And receiving those responses like, well, I didn't even know the lights were going on. Like, and like, that's what you should do. Like, you know, it's like, it's still, you know, artistic. It's still, you know, but but there's meaning to it. Um, More or less, you know, very much a character study. I really liked it. I I don't think I would have noticed it if I'm not always looking at the lighting. (laughs) How did they do that? It was just subtle enough. Like, I didn't realize it until I was halfway through. Like, oh, the lights are flashing now. So I think (laughs) it was a really cool effect to, like, mess with your audience's mind. (laughs) And it's like, um, they may not know what's happening, but, like, it's visual stress and anger that you're seeing yeah i really loved it it was it was great Dude, thanks, uh, very man. effective i guess that's what i'm trying to say <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if, like i said if you watch jurassic parks and like spielberg's probably the man like i mean that compared to like the new ones he, i mean the way he does it with just the camera moves like you know punching in like this is important what you're about to hear or, or this moment you kind of feel terror he does it with camera moves and as a filmmaker i you know, i kind of catch it on the front end but sometimes you kind of get lost in it and you're like, well, I didn't know he, that was a one take. How did he do that? You yeah. know, like it's just one of those things of like hidden in plain sight type of thing. Just because I have a personal interest in it. When you are, when you're working with a DP, how much of the camera movement are, are you in control of? Are you like, okay, I want to push in here or you give them freedom to suggest 
how uh, involved are you in the movement of the camera? So it definitely ranges, but I'm 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 pretty anal when it comes to every uh, everything I want to shoot. Um, as far as when I went out of film school, I, I worked at a small agency. It was it was a lot of coverage, and you know, obviously, there's quantity over quality. Yeah. So you don't have the luxury of sitting down on an edit bay and editing something for two days or three. You know, when the turnarounds are just nasty and crazy. So what I ended up doing is I remember I was editing a lot of stuff that these guys were shooting. And then I just kind of volunteered myself to go and just shoot. And every bit of shooting I did was just specifically for the edit. And so when I know I got it, I got it moving on when I know I have it moving on as far as like transitionally, whatever. And so i kind of take that into my own work. And so every DP I work with, it's like, I give them like a look Bible and then I give them a shot list and I, and I kind of swear by the shot list, yeah. but I swear by it in a sense of one, we have to make our day, whether it's a 10 hour or 12 hour day, but two, I want them to regurgitate everything back to me, almost in memorization of like what we need to shoot and how we need to shoot it. Yeah. But also two, I think once you do that, there's room allocated for the collaboration, so to speak. So for like, for instance, like low key, everything that you see, all those shots were specific and on everything I wanted to accomplish in the edit for both the brand film or the director's cut really. And then the 32nd spot. And so I'm very particular on it. I came out of college, not moving the camera so much. And I got, a I, 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 there's a person that, um, that I worked with and he was like, man, you don't like to move the camera at all. Right. And (laughs) it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And I was like, man, no, I do like to move the camera. And so like, I kind of like from there on, I was like, I'm going to move the camera all the time. Um, (laughs) Just like, and so it just kind of like rubbed me the wrong way. And so ever since then, I kind of keep hearing that. But um, so with moves, I'm even within my, I'm always trying new things, but yeah, I essentially create a shot list, go over with my DP. I have it regurgitated back to me. And I break it down in setups, um, it, whether it's, you know, he has his own, you know, lighting plots and stuff. And that's where I really kind of just trust the DP to kind of own. Um, I'm very picky about uh, focal links we're using. Um, but also, too, like when you set those foundations on the front end, again, when you're shooting and you plan this shot, like whether it's like a dolly in and it's just not working. I think since the DP and you are such on the same playing field that allows like hey you know yeah you mentioned this movie and i remember you used it as a reference like instead of this push in like how about we do x y and z it's like yeah let's do it you know and that's where it becomes fun and but i really believe for me as a filmmaker i need context and so i need to go in with the plan yeah and so um but um it's cool man because it's one of those things like i i'm not trying to be a michael manager or anything but like I've noticed DPs kind of when there's a director with a vision and with the plan, there's, there's definitely more of a trust factor and they know that, okay, this guy is not going to come in and waste time. And every film and everything I do is we specifically shoot for the edit and the edit only. Um, Hmm. Up until recently, like if there's time allocated, like we can try some things out and whether we upload on film supply or whatever, but like in reality, that's, we don't really have that luxury most of the time. So we just, everything's, Everything we plan, we shoot for. But like I said, um, there's definitely shots in a lot of my spots where we had the time of like, man, this is just not working. And, you know, ends up being something, if not better, so to speak. That's awesome. I like that idea of coverage because like I told you before, I came from an ad agency experience where we just shoot a bunch of coverage, get as much as you can, get B-roll that will last, I don't know, get six hours of B-roll that you have to go through for your two minute story so i love that um you have planned every shot and uh uh, very intentional with what you're doing and i think it pays off and i really i think that makes a lot of sense like you set your standard for what you want and hey i need these shots and then have them (laughs) regurgitate it back to you then they could be on the same page Mm -hmm. and you have room for creativity when you need it no 100 percent and mainly the dps i work with i will send them a bunch of references and also movies to watch And so, and then, you know, if they have, you know, I'm not asking them to have the memorize the shot list memorize, but like it becomes easier when you're collaborating and there's, you know, when you're going against the clock and like, you know, if I said, Hey, like 
watch Alien 3, you know, like, <laughs> remember that one shot in Alien 3, you know, of, you know, it was like with this big fan thing, like, it's, I don't have to go and explain it to him, he's already saying, hey, I remember that shot, but remember the scene later, or, you know, remember that other movie you mentioned, those are the things where it's like, it's just fun, and I essentially, too, I like to get, we like to get our gaffers involved as far as lighting, too. We would give them a lookbook and so they can collaborate because usually those guys are the masters and as far as lighting goes. And um, I've had great opportunities to work with some of the best gaffers in the nation, but keeping them involved, even from like, hey, here's what we've tried to plan, you know, what we want to try to accomplish. And they already come with ideas since they've seen everything and so i feel like if you get your crew really kind of on board everything's for the good of the product uh or for the good of the film so to speak because now everybody feels involved and the you know everybody wants to chime in and it's awesome yeah that's that's perfect um i haven't asked you this yet but what is the dream for you matthew because you live in dallas and you're making amazing things there and and Amarillo and in Texas, are you someone, do you see yourself staying in Texas or is the goal moving to LA or New York or whatever the, I guess bigger cities because Dallas is a big city. Yeah. There's a lot of commercials that happen here, but it's uh, a lot of headquarters for big brands are here. Um, but essentially I have representation. It's not exclusive, but with the company here and that alloc- those allocate like the bigger brands. But, oh, you know, I'm noticing that a lot of these bigger brands are still going and hiring production companies in New York and L.A. And I think anything oh. Dallas picks up or he, uh, Austin picks up is a little bit more of like the internal field. And if it is, it's on like it's outputted through like social media or something, which is great. I mean, the pay is still the same. It's just more or less of like how, you know, what is my goal? And so. I, my goal is ultimately it's just to make features. And so what I kind of push myself doing and I thank my wife for doing is that we prioritize of making films and for something like the altar to come up was something was a unique thing because at that time I was kind of doing all these like campaigns and, you know, a lot of that can burn you out and run you dry because, you know, yeah. some of it is, you know, some of it is, of course, jobs and it's work, you know, it's not the most fun thing but you know you're going out you're traveling but you know you can kind of get burnt out and you can kind of find yourself doing like the same old same old or you know you're just directing boards and you kind of feel useless or i'm not neglecting the work but for me the priority is always to make shorts to essentially go into making features because i want to continue to exercise that visual language and so i remember doing i was in between campaigns and the opportunity to direct the altar was presented to me by um a company that was doing a promotion to um, basically influence other filmmakers to make a film using their licensed music. And before that, I got that call. It was like six months prior. I was kind of going through like a slow season. I wrote the altar and like not knowing anything about wrestling. Like I had no idea anything about the sport. I just felt led to like, just write it and, you know, basically write the story about Cain and Abel and kind of do it in a cool modern way, so to speak. And so, um, I wrote that six months ago, not making sense, doing research on wrestling, watching all these movies, watching wrestling events, which was <laughs> not the WWE style, like the, like the Olympic wrestling. And right. I just found it unique. And I found like a, I watched a short film by Steve McQueen called a bear and some of his angles and what he was, it was presented at the museum of modern art. And I just found it fascinating of how he kind of saw the sport of wrestling. Anyways, this is six months Fast forward, I put it down on paper, kind of put it aside, got busy. And then when the opportunity from, you know, this company to kind of, hey, can you make this? Um, I immediately sent them a treatment and the script and they're like, wow, <laughs> like, here's the money, like go. Like, <laughs> and it's like, I keep, you know, I tell young filmmakers and directors, like, if you want to make features, like if you're not faithful over the little, you can't like expect to be like doing the bigger things. And so like, I know people say, I want to be a director of films and, or I'm a screenwriter. Like I want to write features and they haven't wrote a feature screenplay or they haven't done any shorts. And it's like, you you can't just magically, like it can't just magically happen. You start, you need to start exercising that muscle. And so the altar came and, you know, I was ready to go and we did it. And so I think it's for me, it's like the priority and the goal for me is to make features. And so I'm actually currently writing my next short and, you know, 
with my wife, we, what we do is like, we, we sit down and say, how much do you think this is going to cost? You know? And so aside from like all of our bills and stuff. And so, you know, since y'all come up with a number, I was like, I think it's going to cost X amount of X amount of dollars to make this. And, she, and by the time we've reached that, or we feel that it's financially ready, she basically gives me a month to kind of like go into pre production <laughs> and post so we can start implementing and start submitting to film festivals and I know the altar was my first one. I actually went to a film festival and it was accepted at a film festival and it definitely got a lot of hype from it. And it was really surreal. And some of the best advice I got from that film festival was like, Hey, be a familiar face here. Like, and so whether it's like you're making a short or, you know, you're just keep coming to film festivals because that's what kind of puts you like on the trajectory of, you know, making films. And so for me, I to answer your question, whether it's LA, Dallas, you know, I definitely feel like me and my wife are like not necessarily nomads, but like, (laughs) <laughs> you know, Texas is home for sure. But, you know, yeah. it's one of those things like, you know, we definitely have a heart for L.A., not on the specifics of making movies in L.A., but it's more or less of like, you know, a heart for the people there. And, you know, you know, and for me, my goal is to make Christian films and like, but in, in the sense on the basis of like the altar, like where it's like there's a respect of the art of filmmaking. I'm not here to preach. I don't have the answers but I can point you to something that, you know, may, you know, and it kind of has dialogue and stuff. And so um, that's ultimately our goal. And so, um, and what's precious and what's nice is I work with people from LA. And so I think the industry is slowly changing to where things are becoming a little bit more remote or, and especially with this COVID thing um, where you can be a filmmaker, you know, in New Mexico doing good work and doing stuff from LA. I think it's a matter of just getting those connections and, getting in the right rooms as far as um you know whether it's visiting or just kind of keep networking uh so to speak but um but yeah i think our the end goal is definitely la for sure but um you know we're gonna kind of wait on the lord for that one you know yeah that's awesome uh you um you and your wife i i wasn't for sure but when i was reading in like the notes of the different films on your website it's like she's a producer for you or you all work together all the time yeah yeah. Yeah. So she, uh, awesome. she like manages all the finances and, or, you know, she didn't know anything about film until she married me. But like, you know, when it comes to when, when we sit down and talk about numbers, she said, how much you need? Uh, do you need a three ton truck for this? Do you need how many, you know, how <laughs> many, you know, how many do you want? Okay. You want to, you want a key grip, you want a best boy. Do you want two swings? Like, you know, it's just like, she's already has that vocabulary where she kind of cranks out the numbers and she kind of holds me accountable <laughs> and holds me accountable to deadlines too. Cause it's like, you can make your passion projects, but like, again, if you don't have any push and it's hard because you come from client world and you know there's deadlines, but you're like, yeah, it can kind of sit on the show for a long, long time, but she's kind of the one that kind of pushes me to like, Hey, there's this film festival, you know, it costs a hundred bucks, like to submit it, like, you know, type up your EPK, like get it ready. Like, so I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so she's actually more of the brains behind that so well y'all are like the dream team because i love the stuff that y'all are putting out Ooh, thanks man and that's got to be the coolest thing me and my wife uh have started working together more i converted her into like liking photography so now she does yeah photography and she's actually doing better than i am now so <laughs> <laughs> she's better than me she's better than me <laughs> Oh, dude, that's so, awesome. This is how it works. But okay, so last question: If you were to give a younger version of you some, some words of advice, what would you say to a young Matthew Rojas? Like how young? Um, ooh, I, I didn't think about that. I didn't think that far <laughs> through. <laughs> but you're doing your research. Um, I don't know. Like when you're first starting, your first. Or maybe I'll just change the question. If someone is wanting to get started into filmmaking, really, I think if they could have just listened to the rest of the podcast, it kind of has the answer for that. But what would you give advice to someone who's just starting out in their film career slash passion? Dude, I like the question you asked me earlier because it's like, I think the advice I would ask, I wouldn't tell the younger self, but like have the younger self continue to tell me like, hey, don't lose your wonder. Like, again, it's like, for me now for doing it for I haven't I mean it's been a while but like I kind of have my younger self tell me like hey like remember why you're doing this and it's like sitting down and watching you know like pie by Darren Afroski for the first time like remember like that's what you want to do and I think 
you can kind of get lost in that with, you know, responsibilities, you know, uh, with clients and family. But like, I find myself kind of always asking younger Matthew, like, Hey, why am I doing this again? (laughs) Because, you know, there's, (laughs) you know, essentially it's still business and it's still work and, you know, it can, you know, it can get political real quick, but I feel like I ask my younger self, like, Hey, like, why is it, why do I keep doing this? And I keep reverting back to, you know, what the Lord's instilled in me, but also too, like, you know, Hey, this is what you love. This is like, watch, go watch Batman forever. Remember that movie? (laughs) And so (laughs) it's really kind of, for me, the opposite, you know, it was like, I'm the one that, you know, cause you can kind of just get lost. And so it's more of just like, never lose your wonder. And my grandpa would always tell me like, you know, Hey, like your, your identity is not in your work, you know, like don't let it be, don't ever let it be in your work, let it be in Christ. And I can get so caught up in like who, how I sell myself or how I look, you know, through my films and stuff. And I had, you know, developed like, Hey, my work's a lot cooler than I am, but you know, it's, it's, that's not the case. It's like, I've tried to separate the two, but like have fun. And again, it's like, it's one of those things like Hitchcock says, I can't believe I get paid to do this. Yeah. And I have to kind of keep asking my younger self, like, Hey, and I feel like he's like telling me like, never like keep doing it and don't lose your wonder type of thing. So yeah, that's beautiful. It's actually the opposite. I'm sorry. <laughs> but for a young filmmaker starting out, it's like, use what you have, like zero excuses now. Like you can do anything, you know, it's like, it's nobody's going to grab you by the hand. Nobody's going to knock on your door and say, Hey, let's go make this. I remember when I made went out and made my first short film, it made zero sense. I had friends. We were like eating little Caesar's pizza in the back of my truck. Like we're like late at night, you know, like cops show up. What are you guys filming? You know, it does not make <laughs> sense. But like those become great investments on not only just like your craft, but yourself because you're starting to exercise. Hey, like just kind of going out and go and get it, you know, and just trying new things and that's what's that that's the reality of filmmaking and art and so that's you're just learning and getting better at your art so it doesn't make sense at the beginning but it will make sense at the end if that makes sense (laughs) that makes sense (laughs) wow well matthew thank you so much for being on the show i have learned a ton Um, thanks travis i appreciate it i know that uh yeah, for sure. I know that people are going to want to connect with you and um, uh, check out your work. So where would you tell them to go to be the best place to find your stuff? Yeah, they can go on my website, MatthewPeterHoss.com. And then um, I have like all my nice little short films and commercial spots mixed into it. And, and they can always just... Um, text me or message me. I mean, I'm always down to talk and help people. And, you know, I I was gracious to work under a great filmmaker and it was just a matter of reaching out to him. And he said, yeah, and got to learn under him. So people can kind of get the perception like, yo, they're too busy. Then, you know, they're going to ignore me. And it's totally not the case. And most times I found out that's not true. And so, you know, whoever you look up to, like, if you have a question, you know, be respectful, but like, you know, I'll definitely respond. So yeah, they can go on my website or my Instagram at Matthew P. Ross as well. And so, and I'm definitely down to talk and hang. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you once again. And that was Matthew Rojas on the hometown Hollywood podcast. (laughs) I've never done that outro before, but. And that's it. Thank you for listening. I hope this helps you do great work, be the artist you want to be, and helps you not to be afraid to jump in with both feet and make things happen in your film community. Be sure to follow Matthew's work on his Instagram and website. Feel free to send him a DM and let him know how much you enjoyed his episode. I'll leave a bunch of links in the show notes so you can find some of his amazing work. Oh gosh, you're doing it again. You're leaving the show early to leave a five-star review on iTunes. Well, I'm not a traffic light, so I can't stop you. So thanks again for listening and stay tuned for our next awesome guest on the Hometown Hollywood Podcast. Yeah. Uh, was that Justin in your, um, what was it? Immerse, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, was I was like, this guy so pops up everywhere. Yeah. Uh, well, he was uh, living in Dallas at that time working for Film Riot. And I, oh, yeah. I kind of reached out to him. 
And I said, Hey, I need a, I need a, I need a thug. And he was like, I'm your guy. And, <laughs> and my only direction to him was like, just intimidate him. And so he, <laughs> you know, he <laughs> Oh man, that was the funniest thing in the world. Oh man. 